Welcome back, everyone. I believe that a careful study of the Quran and the books that it claims to affirm shows the Quran's author to be demonstrably ignorant of those very same books. In this video, I'll demonstrate one reason why. This Quranic problem has occurred to me numerous times about numerous passages in the Quran, and it did again when I was making a recent video about marriage and divorce in Islam. What we'll talk about now is closely related to a comment from that video which says, the Bible makes the comparison between our marital relationship and our spiritual relationship with God several times. Now I've dealt with the echo chamber comments about biblical corruption a lot. I've given that nonsense much more time than it deserves. But people who actually read the Quran, as opposed to those who spend their days parroting and peddling cheap Muslim apologetics, know that the Quran unequivocally, in multiple passages, affirms the Torah and Gospel, which it asserts were both reliable and present, at least through the 7th century, or whenever you think the Quran was written. Therefore, we can assess the level of knowledge of the Quran's author in at least two ways, using the Torah as an example. First, since we know what the Torah said long before the Quran was written, we can compare the Quran's claims to affirm the Torah with what the text of the Torah plainly says. But as we saw in a recent video, the Quran fails that test. Remember that for some bizarre reason, the Quran requires a once divorced woman to consummate her marriage to a second husband if she wishes to return to her previous husband. Not only is this problematic for moral and practical reasons, it also contradicts the Torah, the book the Quran claims to affirm over and over and over because Deuteronomy prohibits a husband from remarrying his former wife following a divorce after which she has married a second husband. This is a very clear contradiction. But there's also a second way we can assess the Quran's knowledge of the Torah. We can look deeper than a simple surface-level reading and see if broader themes and motifs in the Torah are reflected in the Quran. That's the sort of comprehensive look at the Bible that this comment is referring to. When we do this, we see the Quran's deeper knowledge of the Torah is approximately zero. So I'd like to introduce some of these deeper biblical themes about marriage to you so we can see the ignorance of the Quran's author even more. Let's begin with the creation account. By divine design, marriage is exclusively between one man and one woman, who become one. It's through marriage that the creation mandate is fulfilled, be fruitful, and multiply. The man and woman complete each other in an exclusive relationship. It's very important to note that the exclusive relationship between a man and a woman is analogous to the exclusive relationship between God and his people. Thus, the same word that describes God's jealousy over his people's exclusive devotion to him is also used to describe jealousy in a marriage relationship elsewhere in the Torah, like the book of Numbers, and elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible, such as Proverbs. Thus, in commenting on Exodus 20, verse 5, Nahum Sarna says, The present epithet, el Kanah is most frequently translated a jealous God, a rendering that understands the marriage bond to be the implied metaphor for the covenant between God and his people. Deuteronomy 26 is another excellent example. You have declared today that the Lord is your God and that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes and his commandments and his rules and will obey his voice. In commenting on the phrase that the Lord is your God, Jeffrey Tigay notes, the counterpart to this phrase in verse 18 is that you are his people. This pair of phrases is the classic expression of the covenant relationship, as in 29.12. It is rooted in the formulary used for establishing marriage and adoption, because the covenant creates a family-like relationship between Israel and God. This did not go unnoticed by other biblical authors. So we see, for example, the Hebrew prophets further developing this theme, as they do with so much else in the Torah. Jeremiah and Hosea, for example, speak frequently about how idolatry is analogous to adultery. Many passages from all over the Hebrew prophets could be cited that demonstrate this. And the New Testament also draws from the wisdom of the Torah in Matthew 19. Many other New Testament texts further the parallel between earthly marriages and God's relationship with his people. Here are just a few examples. And of course, at the end of the Bible, a marriage in Revelation 21 and 22. We could go on and on, but now let's turn back to the Quran. 
At the first level of analysis, we've already seen that the Quran fails. It claims to confirm the Torah, but contradicts Deuteronomy 24. But at this second, deeper level of analysis, the Quran's ignorance is shocking. What so many others knew about marriage in the Torah, the Quran shows no knowledge of. Let me summarize some of the problems given our preceding discussion. When it comes to creation, the Quran is too preoccupied with later legends about Adam and Iblis to say anything about humans being created in God's image, about the creation mandate, or about a man and a woman holding fast to each other, becoming one. In the Quran, marriage is not grounded in creation order. As a result, Quranic marriages involve multiple wives, an arrangement that goes extremely well for no woman ever, including Muhammad's wives who were always at each other's throats. And the Quran says nothing about its marriage laws, which deviate from divine design in the Torah being due to the hardness of hearts, like we saw in Matthew 19. Neither is Quranic marriage seen as a parallel between God and his relationship with his people. So there's no problem having sexual relations with multiple wives and slaves, illustrating once again the sexual freedom that Islam guarantees to men. And paradise, not surprisingly, seems like a continuation of the sexual privileges Muslim men are given on earth. The Quran simply gives no indication that it has a clue about marriage's foundation in the Torah or how the Old Testament prophets and New Testament authors expound on this theme. The Quran takes us backwards. Whereas in the Torah and so much of the rest of the Bible, the grounding for marriage is in creation and God's relationship with his people, in the Quran, marriage seems more motivated by the sex drives of men. There's no hint of a connection to creation order. There's no hint of any exclusive covenant relationship. There's no hint of a parallel between marriage and God's relationship to his people. In the Quran, marriage is an institution stripped of everything that makes it ultimately meaningful. Aside from exposing the Quran's ignorance on multiple levels, this inadequate view of marriage has a direct impact on the spiritual, emotional, and physical plight of women in the Muslim world. Oh, but wait, the Bible's corrupted, right Muslims? The Quran's talking about confirming another Torah somewhere that nobody's ever known about. Yeah, for those of you who insist on repeating those echo chamber arguments, fine. Explain to me why the corrupted Bible's model for marriage is so much more sophisticated and so much more theologically rich than marriage in your book, ever so concerned with the sexual satisfaction of men. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.